I think recovery is a really special thing and many of us need it. But I'm going to just go ahead and invite uh, Jay Schiffman up to share his story. So let's give it up for Jay. Welcome to the Choose Your Struggle podcast. I am your host, Jay Schiffman. Welcome back to the Choose Your Struggle podcast. I am your host, Jay Schiffman. This is episode 23. We are chugging right along. I am recording this on July 15th. It's Wednesday. No birthday shout out uh, this week because my birthday was Friday and we passed our goal, which is awesome. I am going to say way more about that uh, probably next week. That's my goal, at least, is to record a whole thing about uh, you know, the, the final amount and what's coming up with that. Uh, but, but stay tuned because there is more news about that coming. But we did pass the goal and we passed it with flying colors. So thank you to everyone who donated again. I'll say way more about that in the coming weeks. Um, this episode is pretty fun. First, uh, about the shout out. There are two guys who have been my closest friends for a long time, one of whom since I was six, the other one since I was 12, 13. One of them you hear me reference a lot, that is Spark Tabor, the host of the Cookies for Breakfast podcast. He will be coming on in shout out for him in a couple of weeks. But the other one is a guy that he is sort of the, the more uh, quiet of the three of us, uh, and he is on today. His name is Pat McGrath. Uh, we've been friends since we were six years old, and he's he's a great dude. He does a lot of awesome work in northern Kentucky. You're going to hear from him today, so that is very cool. You know, I really appreciate him giving his time, and he had some really interesting things to say. I wish I could have played more. In fact, the shout-out's a little longer this week because he had such cool things to say. The interview is with a guy that you may have heard of. You may have heard of him. His name is Greg Nance. A year ago, an American completed a challenge that is uh, very hard to do, and that is the seven marathons in seven days on seven different continents. That American was Greg Nance. Pretty incredible. I've run a half marathon, and I'm good. That's <laughs> I am okay not running a marathon. Greg did seven of them in seven days on seven continents. He's in recovery. Uh, he speaks about that often, and we got connected because someone said, you know, you guys would have a lot to talk about, and we did. Uh, really fantastic interview. He's doing some really cool things, and he's got a great story. So you're going to love that. Keep reaching out. Keep uh, letting me know what's working, <laughs> what you like what you don't like, appreciate the reviews that are coming in and the shares. Special shout out this week to a former guest, uh, Hoodie Time, who has some new music out that is awesome and uh, has, been, has been promoting our conversation sort of wrapped up into his brand because uh, the new song is Truth. It's calling you know, for, for more honesty, for more openness. And uh, you know he talks about how, look, I do that. Check out this interview I did for this podcast. So a uh, huge shout out to my dude, Hoodie Time. Special shout out to last week's guest, Sarah Cornenblit, who shared this thing all over. Uh, she started her own podcast. You should definitely go listen. Those of you who are sticking around, who are fans of hers and learned about this podcast because of her, thank you for coming along. And special thank you to Sarah for, for the promotion. Keep it up. Keep sharing. Keep reviewing. Keep um, reviewing all the things, keep reaching out over social media, over my website. You know, the last three weeks or so, it really has exploded with people reaching out, and I love it. It makes me super happy, even when the people aren't the nicest, which is some of them. Um, you know, people, I had one dude literally insist that I have him on his podcast, and then, like, wouldn't even tell me why. He was like, Google me. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, if you want to come on, be cool about it, you know? Be open to the conversation. 
and uh you know let's 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 try to work on this together this isn't like if you use me for promotion it's not going to be fun for either one of us so that's not the name of this game find me at my website jshiftman.com if you need all the social media handles and stuff like that, the link is in the show notes to my campsite, which is the, the website that has all my, all my links on it. And let's keep these conversations going. I'm going to end it there. Uh, this episode's a little longer this week, and I want to leave time for the good egg and choose your card at the end. Some special messages coming in the future weeks. Like I said, the birthday shout out. Also, a little insight about what's happening on the podcast. That'll come either next week or the week after. But stay tuned and keep reaching out. I love you all. In a world where darkness threatens to overtake life, when you don't know where to turn, when good is challenging evil, one man has the answer. Pat McGrath is the Irish Hammer. That is the best introduction I've ever had, probably. Yeah, I I need need that. That's going to be my ringtone. (laughs) So you wanted to talk about stress. Yeah. Um... It's uh, definitely been a uh, valuable um, item to me and I work at a university too. And so uh, biggest, biggest thing we have with our students coming in significantly is uh, how do they deal with stress and anxiety um, and apprehension of especially change and, uh, and just the, the sometimes overwhelming feelings. So especially in the next generation that, uh, um, that we're, that's, you know, coming up into the world, that is the significant number one concern that we hear uh, from them, uh, at, at least that they're volunteering to us already. So it's something that I discuss with students, um, but it's also something that I've had to tackle in my personal life too, and how I, how I manage that and how, I man- how it manifests itself with me. So not only are you working a, a, a very high pressure and, and, and busy job, but you're also taking how many credits right now in, in law school? Uh, about nine credits a semester. So three classes usually. Which is a lot. It is. It is a lot. Because law school is hard enough as it is. And on top of that, you're working a full job and you're still like in that period. I know you well enough. You also bought a house. You also were, were, were doing a lot of that work at, at your house by yourself. You also have a social life of sorts and you play rec leagues. And so I don't know how you do it. Yeah, it's, it's been tough and challenging and especially um, has, was a struggle, especially early on is what gets sacrificed. And sometimes uh, significantly for me, working out was the first sacrifice. And it was something I used to love to do, grew up playing sports and running, but um, weight has fluctuated significantly and not the best indicator of health, but it was definitely an indicator for me that it was uh, my diet and exercise was significantly hurt. And uh um, so for me, yeah, it was, it was finding that balance and I'm still obviously working on that. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately would deprioritize some of the important things in, in that balance, but yeah, did a lot, did a lot, took on a lot. Um, thought I could handle it. It seemed a lot, uh, or three and a half, four years seemed a lot shorter on the front end of it when I thought this was a good idea, but, um, definitely have, have enjoyed the process and, uh, couldn't even, I think of, you know, obviously we both love Harry Potter when, uh, Hagrid, uh, in the book, first book says after, you know, seven years at Hogwarts, you won't recognize yourself. Um, and I honestly think of that, of how much I've, I've had to grow as a result of everything I've been doing. Nice reference. Hag- Hagrid would be proud of me. That's what I'd like to think. There you go. Besides, you know, making sure you schedule your time and always be reading Harry Potter and watching scrubs. What, what advice do you have for listeners? So yeah, absolutely. Recognizing um, the the balance and what what's your de stress for me. It used to always be just go for a run, um, and then kind of got out of running. Uh, but you know, figuring out a way to work out. And I've been jokingly saying I've I've been enjoying the uh, the iso- self isolation uh, a little bit too much, probably. Uh, but for me, it, it made me check in with myself on what I was enjoying about my work life, what I wasn't enjoying about my work and school life, um, and the what being at home and working from home allowed me to do was structure my own time and have take more control of my own time. Uh, but then also prioritize for me it, working out and being active is vitally important. So for me, it's been that. Um, and honestly, uh, and props to, to you, our good friend, and, uh, as well as our good friend, Spark Tabor for, you know, doing trivia and all that is I still had my social interaction, but it was kind of more on my terms. So instead of being there and I don't want to say martyring, but like sacrificing myself for, Oh yeah, my friends need me. So I got to go now. It's been very much, Hey, I can't make it today or I can make it today. And, and it's been accepted too, of valuing my own time a, a lot more. So, so I think that's what's, I had my own time and so now I've learned to really value it. So that's been a big thing a few years ago, especially, you know, my first year in law school and you know, work was, was a mess, a lot of budget issues, cuts, et cetera. And then um, teaching on the side too. And uh, it was starting to manifest itself where I would, 
not have any sort of social release. And then all of a sudden it would build up, build up, build up for about six months. And then when I did release, it's you're blowing off too much steam at one at once. And uh, so it, it was not, you know, healthy, healthy outlets and it was not uh, productive at all either. Cause then, you know, it was just, I was like, okay, never want to do that again. So then it was just a vicious cycle. Whereas now I'm like, no, it's, Sunday night, go, go play sports or get on the phone with somebody or, uh, you know, have the social interaction. So finding the way to have the hour of relaxation per day, as opposed to saving up six months of relaxation and then, uh, going two nuts on one day or one night, um, ha has been significantly valuable to me. Obviously I, I very much value your, your podcast, the work you're doing as well. So I th I'm preaching to the choir here probably, but following you, uh, I always, you know, got to shout out our buddy spark because, uh, I love the guy and uh, cookies for breakfast is like, if I need a relaxation, you know, his, his podcast is amazing as well. Actually, here's a shout out. Everyone needs to read the constitution. It's only 23 pages. So I'm not saying that will give you all the answers, but at least it'll give people who are on, you know, social media, having opinions, a little bit more grounding in, in, in what they're talking about. I think that'll just solve or help have some of these important conversations that are happening in the country would be more productive discourse that way. Huge shout out to my podcast sponsor, Mountain Maid CBD. Mountain Maid is changing the CBD game by offering a line of high-dose CBD tablets at an affordable price. Their products are THC-free and third-party tested for accuracy, cleanliness, and potency. Their products, which now ship nationwide, include Build for CBD saturation, Boost for precision titration, and Recover for rest and rehab. With nine years' experience in hemp and fitness, Mountain Maid's founders are focused on creating a quality CBD product to help those with activated lifestyles. Check out www.mountainmade.life to find out more about how their product can help you crush your life. And you know I'm all about that. Remember, their products ship nationwide. So go check out the website today and follow them on social media at Mountain Maid. And also listen to episode seven with Mountain Maid founder, Mike Passion. All right, back to the episode. Jay, I'm excited to take part here. Uh, my name is Craig Nance. I am an ultra marathon runner and an entrepreneur passionate about using technology to expand education access, helping students pay for university through scholarships using mentorship delivered over the web. Yeah, so I did a quick, you know, uh, dive into the story. Uh, and you have a pretty fascinating background. I'm very excited to hear it. The, the, the next thing I like to do is give my guests a chance to tell me whether it's the 30 second version or the 20 minute version. You know, those of us in recovery, it's always important to tell our stories. Uh, so that we can break down those barriers and, and end the stigma. So take us through, a, you know, what brought you to where you are today? Yeah, at uh, age 16, I dealt with the first major challenge in my life. My uh, beloved grandpa, Grandpa Charlie, who was living with us, uh, one of the strongest people I'd ever met, a real role model, one of the few adults I think really kind of understood me. Um, he suffered a debilitating stroke. And just like that, he uh, fades away before my eyes. And the one person in the world that I think I could have uh, talked with and worked through this huge challenge was no longer there. And I felt just an immense amount of sorrow and pain and really the, uh, the sense of powerlessness about you know, watching this hero fade away, being able to do nothing about it. And the only way I could, I could uh, move forward at that moment, the only way I felt was to numb that pain. And so I began... Uh, drinking malt liquor, drinking vodka to uh, to numb that, and graduated slowly to opiate painkillers, uh, and then cocaine. And for the next seven years, I lived what amounted to a double life, where I was um, a pretty good student. You know, I was getting uh, decent grades. I was captain of the debate team, ended up winning the state debate championship, making the All American debate team back in two thousand seven, and playing sports. You know, doing really well. But behind the scenes, uh, there was a second life where I was medicating, uh, where I was being deceitful, where I was stealing, where I was driving drunk, where I was getting into fist fights and treating, you know, uh, girlfriends really poorly, just being a um, really just two different paths. And it was clear to me that 
this path is going to lead me to prison or to an early grave. Um, and I've got to get off. I've got to get off. I got to do whatever I can. And, um, you know, woke up Saturday morning, at least a hundred, 150, 200 times vowing that I would never again drink. I would never again drug. And yet eight or 10 hours later, I was drinking and drugging once again. And it uh, only through the grace of God um, was I able to finally find my way into recovery, taking it you know, moment by moment, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, um, in order to kind of find that stride and then stick with it again, moment by moment, hour by hour, uh, day by day. So uh, if I did my math right, you – Enter recovery around 23, 24. Is that right? That's right. 23 years old. Yeah. So I was the same. Um, and I think that I was also 23. And I think that it's, it's really interesting when you have conversations with people at, that, that enter recovery at our age, there's a common theme, which is that those stories of, oh, you know, it was almost, it was so obvious to everybody else from the get go that there was a problem don't really exist. When it's mm. teenagers and, and, and young 20s, because our bodies can handle it better. So like right. you were saying, you were still, you know, I was an athlete and I was, you know, able to party at a level that if I was 10, 20 years older, people would have been like, oh, there's a problem right away. But we for were, sure. if, if you were like me, you could hide it a little bit better for a little bit longer because of how well your body was able to, to fix itself the next day and get back up and keep going. Totally. And that is absolutely, you know, totally resonates here. And I was in part of a variety of cultures where it was celebrated. Like the fact that I could, right. Wow. How much did you have last night? And now you're out at rowing practice or out boxing. Whoa. Right. Uh, and you know, you're the cool guy. If you're drinking a bunch of beers or dancing with the cute girl, um, where in reality, that's, you know, it, it's really a fast track to, to nowhere. And you're going to just run into a brick wall, which um, happened to me a number of times, but I've got a thick skull. So it took learning the lesson a hundred times to finally realize, Hey, like I've got to work through this and get past it. So you enter recovery at 23 and you know, as my listeners know, because I harp this point time and again, not only on my podcast, but when I speak that entering recovery is not the finish line, it's making it to the starting line. So um, talk yeah. about a little bit, what the next, you know, period of your life looked like now that you were finally able to start moving forward. Yeah. So I, uh, I took those first steps, um, kind of cautiously because I, I had actually, I'd made it to, to 40 days twice before I am a, uh, I'm a follower of Jesus and for Lent, uh, twice during college, I was like, look, I have to give up alcohol. Cause I know this is just like, this is screwing up my life. I had made it to 40 days twice. And then on the 41st day, both times, uh, relapsed spectacularly. Um, and so I didn't trust myself. So in those first days I was hoping it just wasn't a mirage and that I was actually making progress. And I was actually in forward. Um, so that, um, that was kind of in the back of my mind, just like a lack of confidence that I can actually do this. I had a lot of anxiety. I was dealing with depression at the time and I was also really lonely. So I was in England as a business school student, far away from, you know, my family, far away from the friends I'd made during, uh, during college and the substitute for alcohol in order to like deal with the nervous energy was running. And so I strap all my running shoes and I got into a daily jogging habit where I would go out kind of cruise around and I found that that would help me put away some of the anxiety and some of the feelings of sadness and loneliness and despair at least for the next 24 hours and then I would do it again and so kind of built a ritual around that and uh, that paired with like journaling meditating reading my bible and then uh, uh, you know I had to stay away from the pubs and the bars which is even harder in England where like that's just a big part of the culture um, and I basically stayed in I'd have like a friend over we would like make dinner or something, have tea, watch a show or something. So really just try to like get rid of the temptations, which were, you know, I was very temptable, particularly at that age and substitute the bad habit for hopefully a good habit. And then, you know, my, my buddy Bob Eck, who's a Baha'i, uh, he doesn't drink due to spiritual and health reasons. We then were able to build a really wonderful friendship, drinking tea, having nice dinners together. So um, that was my early formula and very much the start line. Um, and I think I'm still at the start line. I, I'm 3,000 days 
sober now. And yet every day you got to fight the battle anew. And so I know I'm in, you know, this is the first inning. It's the start line. And I want to live a life free from uh, those vices. And the way you do that is a moment and a day at a time. So as, as you've hinted now a couple of times, you've lived all over, you know, we, I've been on a couple of podcasts um, in, in one in, in Africa, a couple in, in um, Australia, the, the ideas around drugs, the ideas around use, the, the ideas around misuse are different everywhere. Mm. Have you, when you've lived all over, have you found other places that have been more accepting or more supportive of the in recovery lifestyle or less? I mean, what is, what has that been like for you? Yeah. So I've actually, I've lived in China for the last seven years. Um, I'm just back in the States now due to uh, COVID and the Chinese have a, a kind of an even more extreme view toward alcohol where in order to do business with someone and or like build the trust and the bond, you need to drink a lot of Baijiu, <laughs> which is like the Chinese vodka. And it's seen as like totally bizarre if you don't drink. And in fact, if I were a Chinese national uh, or Chinese heritage, I would be ostracized by not drinking. Um, and it would just be like bizarro that you know, you're not drinking. What's wrong with you? Because I'm American, because I don't look Chinese, they are willing to kind of give you a pass. And especially when I share like, oh, I'm a runner and I'm, you know, in order to be the strongest runner, I don't drink. People are, you know, they're still probably somewhat, you know, what's up with that though, they uh, at least pretend to acknowledge and be cool with it. So yeah, very kind of extreme view toward drinking, especially in the business context. Um, done a little bit of work in Russia back uh, after business school. And it's even more extreme there where if you're not uh, drinking, it, um, it's almost seen as like you're kind of cowardly or you're, you're lacking courage or conviction. And so I think you know, in the States, we have, there's a big stigma around it. You know, for seven years, I was in denial until uh, early 2019, I didn't share even with close friends that I had uh, never used the word alcoholic, never used the word addict to describe myself. I, I basically just created a narrative around, oh, I was like a you know, love to party hard, work hard, play hard, because that was easier to talk about. And it was uh, easier you know, for me growing up. It's like, if you're an addict, you're not successful. I wanted to be successful. So like, I can't acknowledge that side of my past. Um, and it's only very recent I'm starting to come to terms with that. So I think in the States, the stigma is very, very strong in a way that, um, you know, a lot of other places face this difficulty too. And that's part of, I know your mission too, Jay, is let's get people talking about this. We got to be honest and open with each other if we ever want to work through this and support one another. And uh, I'm on board with the mission and I'm a, I'm a kind of a new adherent to the mission, but I want to be out there and sharing and connecting because I needed that. And now that I have that in my life, it's all the better. And it's, it's one to move forward on. Well, and that leads perfectly into my next question. So thank you for that. You know, there are, there are two big days for people in recovery. Uh, and that is obviously number one, when you make, make it into recovery, that's the biggest, but now we're starting to see that there's a second big day and that's when you start being honest about it. That's when you start being open about it. Like you, it, it took me five years and it only was because someone literally begged me and said, I think you have a great story to tell. Please do this. And I, I have a story I tell all the time about how I said no four times. Uh, and, and I finally did it and it, it set my life in a completely new direction. And that's a common theme, people. I mean, you, you're, you're telling something very similar so why did you, or what helped you over that hump? What helped you break through that stigma wall and decide I need to start telling this. It's a, it's a good thing to be open about being in recovery. Yeah. So I'll take you back to February, 2019. I, I'm an ultra marathon runner. I had just run seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. Uh, the peak of my you know, athletic career, literally flash bulbs at the finish line my beloved hometown Seattle Seahawks are emailing me for an interview. My friends are blowing up my phone, congratulating me. I should be on top of the world. Um, and yet I feel, I don't feel that way. I feel I'm in pain, uh, both physically, my legs are like on fire. My, uh, I feel lonely. Uh, you know, I, I had been training for this for like two years. I most wanted my now ex-girlfriend to be at the finish line. She's not there. And I just feel like totally empty. And it's like, this is what this is. Like, this is what I've been training for and working so hard for, for two years. 
I get to the uh, hotel and actually I, for the first time in years, I try to score opiate painkillers. Um, I, I know what will numb this pain. I'll just go fly in the clouds for a few hours. It'll make everything better uh, was the mentality. And it was only the next morning I wake up and it's like, wow, like, that was a weird nightmare. Like the, I was trying to get, you know, trying to score, look at my phone it was not a nightmare. I tried just a few hours before. And that was the first time I could be honest with myself that, wow, this isn't just something I did when I was like, you know, really young and really dumb. This is something that's still going on and I'm still fighting the battle each day, even when I don't want to acknowledge that. And I felt, um, you know, I was ashamed about that. I was felt embarrassed about that. I felt guilt about it. Um, and I also acknowledged like, there's a new reality that I need to come to grips with. And I started sharing with, uh, close friends because I just needed an outlet to talk about. And the, the specific moment to your question was sharing with a good buddy in Shanghai, uh, American business guy based in Shanghai. And I, uh, shared, Hey, here's why like, I don't drink. And here's what just happened with you know, this deal in Miami. He starts crying. Uh, and this is a dude who I'd never seen cry. You know, he's like a t one of these macho tough guys. And you know, I'm like, Whoa, like, wh why are you crying? And he uh, tells me that, Hey, you know, the brother that I never talk about my brother's back in jail for robbing people to fuel his meth habit. What? I thought your brother was just some slacker, you know, working on dad's business. I had no conception that your brother's been dealing with this for years, that your family's been dealing with this for years. That is what the stigma does. You can't even be honest and open with those closest to you. That was the, the aha moment for me. I was like, wow, like I, I need to get out there because conversations like that with my buddy and I, um, he has a, a new appreciation for me as a human and my kind of three dimensionality and me with him. And now I can be a much more supportive friend and likewise. And what I've realized from now having this conversation a few dozen times is almost everyone has dealt personally with the demons. They have a sibling, a parent, a partner, a child, a colleague, someone in their life that they love and respect that needs that help and support. And yet we're not being honest with ourselves or each other. And it prevents us from actually moving forward and being supportive. And this really, it's life and death for a lot of folks. If I hadn't had the support network that I did, you know, I, again, I think I'm in prison or an early grave and I want to be, you know, one of the sparks to help other people find their path, whatever that path looks like. And I think recovery is a really special thing and many of us need it. You know, one in seven Americans are dealing with alcohol and drug addiction and, it takes those of us that are finding our path, I think sharing it and helping others to then find theirs. Yeah, that's um, really well put and a beautiful story. And, you know, I hope that your, your buddy's friend is getting the help that he needs. And, okay. you know, I, I, as someone who also has had those moments, you, you don't forget those moments. You don't, no. when, when you, when you tell someone or, or conversely, when someone reaches out to you and said, and says, I don't, you know, I've never told you this or whatever, but I need your advice because either I or my friend or you know, whatever the case is, I'm sure you've had those moments too. Everyone in recovery has that speaks out about it, that someone just goes, I don't know where else to, to turn and you can be that, that person. Totally. And you, you don't, you don't forget those moments. And those are the fuel that hey, they keep you going. Big time. Yeah. So part of that is, is, and, and we're, we're going to, we're going to get a little weeds here for a second is you said, so you are sober, stone cold sober, right? That's right. I, or, or, I'm sorry, I have to clarify because my listeners know there's a couple different definitions. Your AAs, are, are you AAs definition of sober? Um, what is AAs definition of sober? So oh, you yeah. allow, you can have coffee, cigarettes, like that kind of stuff. Yes, I, I've actually got a cup of coffee right here. So yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely on the caffeine train still. Yeah, so. man, I'm with you. I don't, the people who cut out all of it, like <laughs> ooh, cut out the yeah. cigarettes. I, I'm, I'm with you on that one, but cutting out coffee. Ooh. Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. I don't know how you do that. Uh, but but there are people, there are people who who don't believe AA goes far enough. And then that's some of the point I've made in the past is that that that's, that's why you have to clarify what the person's definition of sobriety is. Because if you were going to tell me that you don't do coffee either, I'm going to be like, man, how do you do these ultra marathons? But so you are sober. I am not. I'm in, I, I, my issue was never alcohol, thankfully, because I enjoy a good whiskey on occasion. Nice. Um, 
I'm yeah, envious. But my, so. <laughs> mine, was, mine was prescription pills. Mm. And so that creates a bigger problem because it means that, you know, where there are some people who will still then go to the doctor and if, you know, if they break their leg, they're going to get the pills. I, I have to be like, I can't, like, I, unless I am on death's door and need this, I'm not willing to take that risk. So there is unfortunately people in both camps that, that I mean, there's this culture clash inside the recovery community. Yep. Is that a thing that you've bumped up against as being a person who is both sober, but also not the, not the my way or the highway thinking that permeates too much of both sides of this, of this argument? Yeah. Well, Hey, I, uh, I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I empathize. I, um, you know, I never had as consistent of a supply to get as deep into opiates as, as others. Um, you know, we would steal from one of my friends, dad, who was a doctor and had just a, a loaded medicine cabinet. And, uh, yeah, I would steal from him. And that's how I would basically score and then sort of hoard that. Uh, but I would run out you know, within a couple of weeks or a month. Um, and then, yeah, go through a couple of days of withdrawals and just booze up to, to fuel that. So it, uh, for me, I have tried to sort of rehabilitate myself with, with pills. So I do like a daily vitamin, which obviously is like good for you. Right. Um, I also do <laughs> ibuprofen, which is probably less good for you. I mean, there's the jury's out about that though from like, I run quite a bit, hundred miles a week. And so to control inflammation, you know, I have dietary, try to have like a low inflammation diet and then an occasional ibuprofen when I'm feeling like sore. And that's one where I try to watch myself and, you know, I max out at two um, per dose. I try to stay always under the controlled amount. And I haven't injured myself to the point of needing, you know, prescription painkillers, though, like that will be probably an awkward conversation with the doctor. Like, hey, here's a little bit of you know, my past. I want to be extraordinarily cautious on this. Um, and I don't really even know the protocols for that, but that's how I'd um, you know, try to be honest uh, about it and to, so that you're kind of safeguarding yourself. Um, but to your, your broader point in the question, I think really every one of us needs to define um, our path um, as we get on it to figure out what, uh, what path makes most sense for us. And so like, I'm envious that you're able to enjoy a good whiskey on occasion because that's awesome. And mm -hmm. I wish I had the fortitude to do that because I liked whiskey too. And it was great. Mm -hmm. And the first one or two are awesome. And then like the fifth or eighth are less awesome. And so that, right. that's my problem, right? So, um, and so for you kind of finding that path where, Hey, like an occasional whiskey is delicious. That's, that's, that's great. Um, and I, I wish I could do that though. Um, I'll stick to coffee um, and <laughs> fruit juices as, as a couple of my vices. Um, that, uh, but yeah, that said, I think that each of us needs to define that. And if you can work with a sponsor or a healthcare professional or trusted friends and advisors that can help you think through what that path safely looks like for you, uh, that'd be my recommendation um, so that you do it safely. Well, and you make a really great point. Uh, sort of a broader point when you talk about the ibuprofen use it's all about the mindfulness of aspect right i mean i can have a, a whiskey or or two but I, I know okay i'm not having that third and if i find that i've had a drink like three days in a row i'm taking three to four days off mm. i don't know that that's going to trigger something i don't want to take that chance and it's not worth <laughs> it to me you know <laughs> so it's that mindfulness like you were saying that you can have an ibuprofen you're going to be fine you can have two but you're not willing to go beyond that because you don't know and you're not willing to take that risk big time yep well said. so it's that mindfulness piece of, of being aware and that's such a big part of recovery and that is just like you were saying is figuring out your own path but making sure that you are aware of your path and mm. being sort of in touch with that 100 percent, and too often we can fall into you know, either dogmas without really questioning it, or uh, you know that's there's its own challenges over there. And then there's the second group, which is I'm just going to keep on living this destructive lifestyle and hurting myself, hurting loved ones. And um, you know, for some folks, maybe a more dogmatic, very strict path is is the way because otherwise I fall off. And um, we each need to kind of think through that. I think mindfulness that's a great uh, kind of mantra around all of this. 
So let's use that as a shift. You you are a long distance runner. Yep. Uh, and as you said, um, you I, I knew of your story. What's what's funny is I knew that your story before I knew y- you. Like I I knew everyone. I, mean, I don't say everyone. A lot of people have heard the story about the guy who did the seven marathons and seven continents in seven days. Like that was a headline story. What was that? Two years ago, you were saying last year. Yeah, year and a half. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so you know, this is a question I ask people. Uh, that they get a lot of that focus and I've had musicians and, and stuff like that on how Hmm. do you maintain um, sort of the, the sense of groundedness and that sense of mindfulness in those situations that a, a, if you're not, you know, focused, if you're not mindful will tear you off of that real quick. Totally. And I'll say doing this challenge I was, you know, so I, I'm an addict and I live my entire life as an addict, uh, you know, as do many of us that, that are, that face the, uh, uh, this, this challenge. And I try to turn it into a, you know, I try to turn that obstacle into an opportunity and into like just a mindset around all my life. And so training for the world marathon challenge, obsessive, you know, I have like an addict, addicts like obsession and focus about how am I going to like get the legs ready? How do I get my mind ready? How do I get the logistics operations funding all together? And I was really good at all of that, right? But I lacked the mindfulness where, you know, I was dating this really wonderful woman. And over at a certain point, she asked, like, hey, are you dating me or are you dating running? And like this, this challenge, uh, right? And that ends up, it destroys our relationship, which was a huge bummer and like, you know, overwhelming. Um, I'm running a business. I'm a CEO of a startup company. And yet like my obsession shifts from like building this business and being the best employer and the best boss I can be into the best running addict and ooh, you gotta be careful. Cause if you're not mindful, so much of your life can kind of get wrecked as you pursue this big goal um, as obsessively as I, as I pursued it. And so one element is keeping balance and keeping routines and rituals that help you find that balance. You know, I think Einstein quipped about life is like uh, riding a bicycle. You got to keep moving forward. And that, uh, that sort of mentality, is really important for me because I've seen this movie before with myself where I, I come off the rails pursuing the shiny object or this trophy or this accolade or this recognition. Um, it's one more thing I'm addicted to. It's like I am addicted to achievement and I want to go get that trophy. Uh, and I think that can be a good thing. You go do some good in the world, hopefully. You try to help others, hopefully. But it also can leave a wake of destruction in your life, which, you know, the World Marathon Challenge is frankly, it did. It, it ended up uh, undermining a lot of things that are really important to me. So that mindfulness, definitely, definitely key. Um, I try to write in a journal um, each night about things I'm grateful for, big challenges I'm working through and how I can, you know, face them in the next day and the weeks and months ahead. And uh, that helps me keep a little bit more grounded, a little bit more perspective. Because as an addict, I have tunnel vision about like what's right up in front of me. What do I need? What am I craving? And life should be about more than just what you're craving or what that immediate need is. So that uh, that's something I'm still trying to learn. And even as I'm saying it out loud, I've got so much work to do on that. And I think it will be a lifelong you know, journey in that respect. So let's pause real quick. I want to give all my listeners a chance to follow you or, or, or- check you out. Where can my listeners find you? What do you want us to know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I have like a daily kind of running blog on Instagram at Greg runs far. And I try to share things I'm learning about being a long distance runner, things I'm learning in recovery. Um, and it's, you know, try, try to just share a little bit of the journey there. Uh, and you can also connect for my email newsletter at Greg runs where I kind of post updates and things I'm working on as well. So let's then now use that to shift. What's next for, for Greg runs far where, you know, where are you headed with COVID in mind or, or without? Yeah. So I'm i uh, I'm back in my boyhood hometown right now, Bainbridge Island, Washington, and I am training for the biggest, craziest, perhaps stupidest thing I've ever tried, which is running uh, from New York city to Seattle. Um, I just celebrated 3,000 days sober, and I want to mark the milestone with a 3,000-mile run uh, from New York to Seattle. And the part that I'm actually most excited about, I'm partnering with a filmmaker named Sarah Shetsky, and we're going to create a documentary about not only this run, but more importantly, about the stories of addiction and recovery that we meet along the way. And so we want to tell stories 
to inspire folks that overcoming addiction is a marathon, not a sprint. I love it. So let's uh, logistically, how, do, how does that work? How do you run from New York to Seattle? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big one. So um, I'm going to be averaging about 40 miles per day. And in order to kind of keep that pace over the 70 plus days, I have an amazing support team. And so we're going to have an RV where I'll have kind of nutritional needs taken care of, where I'll sleep each night. That's where we'll actually do like route planning and navigation and where our film team will actually be hanging out during the day as well. So immense amount of operations and logistics. And uh, those that know me or that have worked with me know that I'm not a detail guy. So I've got a great team luckily coming together that's going to be working on each of those elements. And when are you leaving? How, how, you're, in, you're in, you know, uh, near Seattle right now. How are you getting to New York? What are you, how is that going to work? Yeah, so we were initially planning for a September start, though with COVID pandemic, um, I don't think that's going to be safe yet, just given all like the models I'm seeing of and new surges and spikes. So it uh, most likely this is going to get pushed to spring 2021 after we've got a vaccine, though I am, my mentality is, look, I'm controlling what I can control. That's my training. That's my attitude. That's my diet, my sleep. And then there's so much outside my control. And I, you know, I want to, I want to use this run to hopefully uplift people, to give people a spark of inspiration. Uh, and I don't want to be a carrier for the pandemic while doing that. And so, um, yeah, won't want to be mindful again. I love this. Be mindful about how, uh, how we approach that uh, as we go. So how are the how are the stories? How is that part going to play into this? Are, are you you know are you inviting people to join you on the route? I mean, what's what that what's that going to look like? Yeah, so part of this is going to be pure serendipity. So like I'm I'm running across. I love like uh, you know Denny's. I love diners, and so <laughs> I'm going to be jumping into like IHOPs and you know local spots. I'm having a breakfast. I've got one of the uh, camera people with me and, you know, maybe a young lady, an old man, you know, somewhere in between comes up and is like, Hey, what's up with the camera? We start chatting about, Hey, here's why I'm running across the country. And my aim is to actually capture you know, these serendipitous moments and just these incredible people that have incredible stories as we're going across. And uh, that paired with, you know, I want to do school assemblies with kids to share a little bit of my story. Uh, hopefully some like, community groups. I want to uh, kind of keep the faith strong. So Sunday morning services uh, when churches reopen. And so all of this kind of collected together. And then we're, we have a production team and we want to identify some really, really amazing stories before we set out as well. And whether it's like a survivor circle in Cleveland or a city council member in Gary, Indiana, <laughs> uh, youth leaders in Chicago, you know, so that way, as we do the run, we also have some really cool programs and really awesome folks that we're able to meet too. So then for people who are interested, you, you know, I'll give you a chance here to shout out again, where to find you, you know, just a very broad strokes. Are you, you know, how are you going to get from New York to Seattle? What's the route you're thinking of, of doing? Yeah. So it's basically like due West. So I start, I run through uh, Manhattan and then through uh, uh, Pennsylvania, getting through West PA into, I think it's Ohio, down through Indiana, and basically want to do this as efficiently as we can while hitting a few of the, the big cities too uh, as we go. And so yeah, it'll be kind of under Lake, uh, Lake Michigan and then sort of due west. We're planning to go through Standing Rock Reservation in uh, South Dakota and then sort of head north by northwest, um, straight west. So, you know, as I run, not nearly to the extent you do, I mean, you know, me running to your running is go karts to NASCAR. But what, <laughs> what do you, how does your, what, what is going on in your mind when you're running that 39th and 40th miles? I mean, I couldn't do it. I tell you that right now, both physically and mentally, but like how, where are you during all of this? Well, the first thing I'll say is that the first mile is actually the hardest. Like for anyone that, that wants to get out there, um, it's the first mile that's the most difficult. Once you actually lace up your shoes and you've committed to, hey, I'm going to go get a run in, um, you were already half the way there. Um, you know, I ran 41 miles yesterday on a training run. And during the 39th mile, I was thinking about, hey, like I'm hungry. I'm going to have a really, really delicious lunch, uh, number one. I, um, when I need a little spark, I've got playlists. So I'll throw on some good music. You know, I have a terrible taste in music. So I'm on like top 40 stuff. 
uh, and I'll spice that up with some Led Zeppelin maybe or some Beatles or Stones. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I have audio books I download too. And so I just finished Russell Brand's Recovery, which is a wonderful book. I was expecting pretty good. This was, this was great. I uh, love that. I love history. So I, I, as soon as I'll take my mind totally elsewhere, but I also love working through a challenge that I'm facing. And so, you know, I'm a business owner and there are a lot of challenges day to day to day with how can I be the best leader I can be? How do we expand our business? How do we take care of our people? How can we deliver a better service? And a lot of those questions need just hours of thought and just you know brainstorming and riffing and thinking. And a long run is a wonderful place where there's very few distractions. Yeah, I put my phone into airplane mode and I just think about big questions. And oftentimes I'll get back to my desk after a quick shower uh, and I will quickly type out the ideas I had into an email or into a little memo. And then, you know, boom, that big challenge is now we've got some marching orders for how we can do the best job we can do. So we always finish with the same two questions. Uh, one of them you've already mentioned a little bit, which is, is uh, your personal self-care habits. Uh, but if you distill those down in just a couple of actionable tips for my listeners, that'd be awesome. And then number two is, you know, we, we give you a chance to shout out where people should follow you, but this is your chance to say, all right, these are the people that inspire me. Yeah, hundred percent. So on the self care front, uh, the, the single like keystone habit for me is eight hours of sleep. If I'm getting good sleep, like everything else is better. My anxiety, my depression tend to stay at bay or at least are minimized. I have more energy. I make better decisions with diet. I have more willpower. It's like things are better when I'm sleeping eight hours. And if you want to see like a human gremlin, see me at four or five hours of sleep. And so it really makes a massive difference. So uh, I highly recommend you know, tweaking your lifestyle, trying to get to bed earlier and pushing your calls later in the morning. So my first calls are generally 11 a.m. So I can sleep in if I get to bed late. And if I get to bed early, great. I have a couple hours of you know, time to do some solo work or some training to get things going. Um, the second self-care piece is stretching. I love feeling loose and limber, and it's hard to do that when you're running you know, 100 miles a week. So I do a ton of uh, stretches um, and a lot of just like big circles with my hips, with my shoulders, with my knees, with my ankles, uh, before kind of bending and leaning in uh, in all directions. And so that keeps me feeling youthful. Um, instead of feeling like an old man over here. So I, uh, I recommend the stretching too. As far as inspirations go, so I'm, uh, I'm rereading the Gospels right now. I find just a lot of uh, kind of meditative uh, wisdom in just rereading uh, God's word there. So for those that are uh, believers or just looking for some beautiful philosophy, I find the, uh, the Gospels, the Davidic Psalms, and the Book of Daniel to be just go-tos that I'll, I'll cycle back through. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I definitely recommend my listeners go follow your journey and I will be following from afar as well. Great. My pleasure, man. I'm so glad we got in touch and I'm looking forward to staying in touch as well. All right. We've reached the end of another episode of the Choose Your Struggle podcast. Thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you got as much out of Greg's conversation as I did. And I hope you enjoyed what Pat had to say in the shout out. Here's something that I love about both of these. Pat and I have been friends now for 27, 28 years. Oh my God. <laughs> A long time. And our backgrounds are very dissimilar in a lot of ways, very similar in a lot of other ways. But we've always been friends on a human level because, you know, we're both, I like to think, good people. At least I hope that's true. <laughs> and the same thing is true with, with Greg. You know, we come from very different backgrounds. He is, as he said, both a 12-step uh, recovery guy and also a uh, religious guy. Neither one of those is, is my experience. But we have so much in common in other ways, and we're both fighting for a bigger issue. That, that really brought us together 
when some of the things that are different about us could have could have separated us. So those kind of conversations give me hope. Those kind of friendships give me hope. And uh, I hope you you all have some of that as well. You know, uh, it's easy to get separated, and and there's reasons we sh- should be. You know, um, you know, when I think about all the work that we're doing around, well, you know, from racial justice to criminal justice to civil rights, if somebody doesn't agree with those things, that's a problem. You know, someone's civil rights is not a political issue, quote unquote. And and if someone you know tells me. Oh, I don't like to talk about politics when I talk about civil rights. I I I have very little patience in in that moment. But there are other things that are not nearly as causeworthy to separate us that bring us together, that we can find ways to come together around. And in the positives that are just as important that we all agree on, or or in, I'm saying in this setting that we agree on to bring us together. And I hope you heard that in Greg's and my conversation. I hope you get that from this podcast, that there are things that even though, you know, the, the recovery community is a very big tent. And, and I hope that you hear that there are ways for all of us to come together in that that tent, even if we have different experiences. Without further ado, we're going to do the choose your card. You've heard me probably playing with them. <laughs> Today's card pack is the Believe in Yourself card pack, as always, brought to you by Blurt, the Blurt Foundation. Check them out. They're incredible, and they don't pay me to say this. That's how much I love their work. Today's card from the Believe in Yourself card pack. This is a good one. This is this is important. This is really important for what I have to say next as your good egg. Our mistakes are our teachers, not sticks with which to beat ourselves. Mistakes teach us what we might say or do differently next time. They allow us to grow, learn, and move forward. That's pretty great. Let me, let me tell you why that's so important. Today's good egg is I want you to go check out some friends of the podcast. It's a it's a another podcast. It's called Leaving the Valley. I had the incredible good fortune to chat with the host of the Leaving the Valley podcast. The podcast is hosted by Dr. Sam, who is an awesome psychologist, and his his daughter Kimmy, who both have uh really just their dynamic is incredible because they ha- they have the father daughter relationship, but also Kimmy is a poet in the way that she talks on this podcast, and her dad is such a wealth of knowledge. They are having and starting conversations around suicide awareness, and it- it's so important. This topic is so important. I-, I gave a speech yesterday on Wednesday to a group here in Charleston, South Carolina, in which I talk about you know my experience with suicide. And uh, I also had the the good fortune of interviewing the mental health comedian Frank King earlier this week. He'll be on a later episode of the podcast and I was on his. So if you search for Frank King and Jay Schiffman, you'll you'll find our conversation. He is uh, a, a longtime comedy veteran who now is a suicide awareness speaker. This is a topic that's incredibly important. As I said in my speech yesterday, we lose 125,000 Americans every year to overdose and suicide. Not the other causes of death that come with those struggling with mental health and substance misuse, just those two, 125,000. That's roughly what we've lost to COVID-19 so far this year. So imagine that crisis every year for the last decade, and yet no one's talking about this. I I shouldn't say no one. It's just very, very small, very, very quiet conversation. That's why this is so important. That's why recognizing our mistakes, our education, and not the defining moments of our lives, not the sticks to beat ourselves with, as this card so eloquently said, 
they do allow us to grow and learn and move forward. So check out the Leaving the Valley podcast. They are just, they're having the conversations that need to be had. They're starting conversations that need to be had. And reach out to me, reach out to that, the, the, the father-daughter awesomeness that is the host of Leaving the Valley. Reach out to Frank King. He, he says this all the time, that he's willing to talk. He never turns down an opportunity because he wants people to be talking about these issues. Reach out to whoever. There is somebody in your life. We have a saying in this line of work. We'd rather spend two hours talking to you today than two hours attending your funeral tomorrow. Reach out. Spread love. Show your empathy and your vulnerability and choose your struggle.